and where did that lead to? And uh, I had a number of different ways of looking at it and a whole series of introductory comments, which I've thrown out the window because uh, in the last couple of days, I've had the remarkable opportunity to go work and visit at the Oak Spring um, Garden Foundation Library of Rare Books and Antiquities. And so I've kind of bumped up a couple of slides from that visit to illustrate what the talk is all about. And you've got the Ron Gould there as my heading for this slide. Um, this is one of the uh, series of manuscripts I was able to look at. And as you can see, this is um, the presentation to the Zoological Society by John Gould. His name is the only one on there. And he's a very famous ornithologist that worked with Darwin's birds and classified and, and published on birds extensively. Uh, but the interesting thing is, and this is what I was looking for, if you open those folios and go down to where the actual bird drawings are and then drop down here, um, you will find that it's actually signed um, from Elizabeth Gould. And as noted by uh, Ed Lear and Elizabeth, she was the one who actually made uh, John very famous in terms of the artwork presentation where John was really very much more the scientist. And so one of the things I've come across in this study, I call this kind of barrier number four, is when um, people were not able or um, approved to put their own names on the work that they've been doing. So you do find it down here in the um, uh, tiny line at the bottom of uh, stamped on each one of the pages. And I went through the folios together. And there it is. So part of what I'm getting at is how do people emerge from that and how are they able to represent themselves? So uh, they were husband and wife, of course, but Elizabeth was never recognized fully in all her capabilities. And her work is absolutely astounding, as we'll see in a, in a little bit. The second example, where do I find an illustration and author on metamorphosis? Well, um, I have over here at the right, the current and or a current AP biology textbook, and you can see metamorphosis is in there, but there's absolutely no mention of Maria Sabia Marion, who was the first person to really observe that and bring it to the attention of, of uh, Europe and, and henceforth America. And her book, uh, the very famous book is the one sitting there in the center which is on the metamorphosis of the insects of Suriname. And she went there at, at, at an age by herself with her daughter and for two years studied these. And you can see her illustration uh, from a different book uh, on the left of the screen. So again, we see a case where um, I call this a barrier three, where you're not able to get acknowledgement for the type of work that you've been doing. It came very late in her life and it also came late in Elizabeth's life. So this, this was just very resonant in my mind and a point where I wanted to start with, but I wanted to go into um, where else this came from. So at the time I was teaching biology and I began to realize that we weren't quite catching up enough to the current world of biodiversity and that our, uh, curriculum was very heavily biased on a certain type of a scientist that we included in the books. As I just showed, uh, there wasn't room for uh, Maria Marianne, but others were there. So I wanted to look at, could we compare and contrast the emergence of these women naturalists into uh, scientific education and so forth? And that's where, that's where it really started from, a real curiosity about how to look at this. So why is this important? Well, there's a global call for increased capacity in characterizing, conserving, and using biodiversity. Uh, I have um, tabulated this. There's, it's needed in the field, in the museum, and the lab. And the naturalists are kind of like a direct portal into those different worlds. But our demographics are changing, and our student body is diversifying. But in these multi-ethnic classes, science isn't quite changing changing along with them. So I looked to see if there was a way that at least um, on the gender side, women naturalists could be 
part of this curriculum and lead back into biodiversity. So that's where a lot of this came from. So let's look then at the faces of biology today. These are the science pioneers. Well, we have Reddy on spontaneous generation. We have Hook and Leeuwenhoek for uh, the cell and the animalcules that were under the microscope. Then we have Virchow, Slide, and Swan for the cell theory, uh, the three of them together. And of course, Mendel down in the bottom right for genetics. So you will be noticing a common theme, no doubt, as we go through these pictures. Uh, then we come to Darwin and Russell, Alpha Russell Wallace, uh, co-developers of natural selection, Ka uh, John Krebs on the Krebs cycle and Calvin as well on the Calvin work, uh, excuse me, on the metabolic work and the photosynthetic work. And then we have Watson, Francis Crick, and here we come to a woman, Rosalind Franklin. And then we go back to men on uh, Wagner and and finally, if you're lucky, to uh, Rachel Carson. So this is where um, we begin to see kind of the heavy weight that's taken up um, in getting through a biology course by all the people that have developed these things, but yet not opening it up in terms of, well, are there other people? Are there others that we could be involving in these discussions as well? And that's where this is really what's kind of sparked my curiosity into it, was looking at it kind of in a pictorial way like this. So where are we then in terms of science standards? Well, biodiversity comes in in one place only in the next generation science standards, and that's in evolution. And here you can see create or reverse a simulation to test the solution to mitigate adverse impacts of human activity and biodiversity. So if you're lucky enough to get there by the end of the year, this is where um, some work can be done on, on this particular topic. And this is really the only place. Well, that may be sufficient for many people, but then what happened was I also a um, great reader of E.O. Wilson. And uh, I came across this particular passage from his book on um, creation and on centering biodiversity uh, in an educational setting. And he says that education and biology is important for the welfare of humanity and for the survival of the rest of life. The general indifference of people to the living world is a failure of introductory education in biology. I think there's great truth to this. The shortfall has been worsened by the common misperception that rigorously scientific biology means molecular biology and biomedical research. But as I have argued, half of biology now and probably more than half in the future lies in the study of biodiversity in the living environment. Um, that was said some time ago, and if we take that to be kind of um, a, a set of marching orders or direction, then I feel part of what is embodied in these naturalists is a way to get to this. I don't think we're there now. I think we have a ways to go to make that happen. All right, now I also mentioned that part of the things that Montgomery County and Maryland has to be aware of and working towards is this change in demographics. And you can see that here in terms of the uh, racial identity of Marylanders in the circle graph, and then also uh, on the demographic changes occurring in the student population in Montgomery County Public Schools, which is where I've been teaching. You can see that the uh, blue starts to fade into a rainbow of colors as we approach the year where we are at today. And uh, this is a trend that is continuing. So uh, now um, um, uh, racially white alone are less than 50% of the population in the, in the state. And the schools, when the students come in, all they're seeing are those 13 or so faces that I showed you uh, just a few slides ago. So how, how do we begin to kind of account for that and begin to differentiate? And that, that's where my study really started. So I'm going to kind of briefly go through the 
methodology because I want to really get to the to the results and, and what came out of it, but I want also to, to show kind of what I went through to achieve this. So it was a uh, scoping study where we started with um, a number of queries uh, looking at anthologies. And I picked anthologies because they represent a selection of people that have picked others because of their representative stature in the field. Whether you think of an anthology of poetry or an anthology of literature or science and so forth. And as we go through those, I would pull those out and get the records together and then go through them point by point, uh, chapter by chapter, sorting out where there were male and female naturalists in the, in the groupings. And um, one of the things that I then came up with was over time, you could plot this out like this. So in the gold, you have the male naturalists. And of course, uh, beginning with one of the first collections in 1940, they're, they're 44 with one woman represented, and that was Rachel Carson. Uh, 1950 or none. And then in 1970 and on, things started to change. And as they change, you can see that over time, there were years where women began to pull together these anthologies and more women began to appear as naturalists in their volumes. Until we come up to finally a total of, um, of that time period of 92 individuals that have been reported in one form or another, in various pieces of literature and, uh, and anthologies that I collected and went through. So 82% um, of the total recorded were men and 18% of the number of women naturalists in this study. And the most consistently mentioned were Sabia Marianne, um, Mary Anning, and Rachel Carson. After that, it became very individualized based upon where the anthology was going, but nonetheless, they're naturalists. So what we're beginning to see, and this was the, the point, of, is that when an effort is made, we can bring along these underrepresented groups. And part of it is self-recognition, and part of it is the allowance of a system to let this begin to prosper. Okay, so let's go from there to um, looking at the uh, percent of natural over time and how things have changed. So now with the internet coming on board, the expansion of the rec self recognition of women naturalists by themselves has become immense. Uh, it was so much that I, I couldn't calculate it all together, but put some of these sites up here and some of the names and so forth. You'll see a Natural History Society of Northumbria and Britain has done a whole thing on the naturalists from Northeast United Kingdom. And um, you see that there's women illustrators in natural history and a wonderful website on her natural history, a celebration of women in natural history. All these things now have started to flourish. So we've gone from a situation of kind of real paucity of exposure and recognition to a situation now where this is becoming much more available and mainstream, although there's still a lot of this that's not filtered into lessons that we can use in the classroom. All right, so that's kind of the, the change that I've seen and where I wanted to go with the story. But then I started to take some lessons out of all of this. And if you excuse me for a moment, I'm gonna dive into baseball here. Um, in baseball, we had a series of individuals that looked like they were on their own, but really were supported in the background by a number of people, but they were barrier breakers. And in the picture that I show from the Bethesda baseball program, uh, you have Roberto Clemente, Hank Greenberg, and of course, Jackie Robinson. And on the stamps on to, to the right are all the people that owe their career to following behind Jackie and befriending him and getting to know him and play alongside him and get onto their own clubs. And so in a lot of ways, these naturalists have become barrier breakers as well. And if it can be done there, it can be done for other groups that are underrepresented in, in the state and in our school system and our natural history society and other places as well. There's a way to help this happen. 
but it takes a lot of courage on the first round. Uh, Clemente, Greenberg, and Robinson, each of them had a tremendous amount of vitriolic messages coming to them, their families, their club, their team, uh, throughout a lot of their career. And uh, it wasn't until certain things occurred that, and, and at last they were kind of fully accepted, that a lot of that started to die away. But even for Clemente, there was a Latin American ball player kind of bill of rights that was drawn up to try to strengthen their kind of acknowledgement within the clubhouses. Uh, Hank Greenberg, who played for Detroit, um, kind of underwent some of the most vitriolic anti-Semitism of any ball player that, that's been on the field. And Jackie Robinson, of course, was the first person to come on and break a color barrier that had been imposed through the gentleman's agreement, so-called in baseball. So I'm trying to bring these up because I'm going to mention it here as we kind of go forward now in terms of um, looking at the, this over time. So here, if we look at Sabelia Marianne, you can see that she departs for this trip to Suriname in 1699. And if you look over where Charles Darwin is, it, this is almost 150 or more years before Darwin set foot in the Beagle. Just what an accomplishment. And yet we don't have that story ready in the classroom. Uh, Linnaeus hadn't even published his system Natura until 1750. And she was already out taxonomically and very correctly identifying the insects that she was drawing and the cycle of metamorphosis that she was bringing to uh, the world's attention, really. Um, you can see the most active years for the naturalists between 1820 and 1870. That's kind of the heyday for that. And that is a time period in which Mary Anning was collecting her prehistoric animals at Lyme Regis um, on the English coast. And we'll talk about her more in a minute, but she was a very bitter because she never received recognition to the scale she thought appropriate for what she had done. Now we start moving down after 1900. We have uh, Margaret Fontaine's butterfly diary was found upon her death with 20,000 butterflies that she had been donating. Uh, Wangari Mathai was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Margaret Mee is publishing her work from the Amazon. Uh, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, Diane Fossey uh, going into work with the gorillas, and of course, Jane Goodall with her institute, and so on and so forth. So it becomes an overwhelming uh, affirmation of what is possible once this kind of ball gets started rolling. Oh. Well, I have kind of my Ammonite road um, on this development, and I call the first people out the pioneers, and then we have people that are following after them, multiplying that effect, and then people becoming specialists, and then eventually things become codified. And what I mean by that is that there is no longer a distinction or a problem with a, a, any, a, any person being an author that's accepted, societies are accepted, and finally teacher mentors, and then lastly, um, a planetary sage. And so what I want to do is kind of follow that a little bit after we get through the barriers and look at some individuals who have achieved that. So where were the barriers that I saw in these studies? Education, the informal education that many of these women received at home was instrumental in their development. And the fostering of that really helped them overcome many of the other obstacles they faced because for so long, formal education was denied them. Scientific societies, this is a second point that I saw. They were often uh, kept away from many of the minorities, not just the women. There was an inability to join. You had to be invited. And this hampered recognition tremendously. Their own research, women naturalists were viewed as collectors or hobbyists and not seen as really able to conduct thorough research. And I think we've talked about some of that already. Authorship. Credit was often determined by others, leaving out the naturalist's name. Financial support. Initially unable to garner enough external money to really do what other people were doing. Charles Darwin was able to go on the Beagle because of his father's wealth. 
His father actually paid for his entire tenure aboard the ship, as well as the shipment's home and so forth. So that type of benefactor didn't exist in, in many, many cases. Um, uh, Maria Sevilla Marion was able to patch together different puns to get her to Suriname, but it's very difficult. And time delay, scientific achievements, instead of being appreciated fully at the time with your name noted were accounted for later in life. And we'll see some things about that. So how do these six barriers get turned into equivalencies and achieve a, a balance? So that's what I want to look at by taking these five naturalists out of the 10 that I, I came down to. So um, we'll talk about Sibylla and Marianne, about Anning and uh, Calvina, Carson and Wangari, and I'm watching time real carefully. So I will try to do my best with each of them, but they each have a different point uh, to talk about. So in terms of um, Sibylla and Marianne, as I said, she next to Rachel Carson is the most included in all of the work that I've been seeing. But as you can see, in terms of challenges and praise, she was criticized as unladylike for traveling to Suriname and searching out for these insects. She was even criticized for the beauty of her plates. People didn't understand why you would be portraying insects and stages along with these beautiful flowers and tropical uh, uh, growth. And that artistic composition meant that um, it differed greatly from the earlier naturalists, and, and she was not greeted pleasantly for that. But as time went on, she persisted, and her books began to accumulate, and sales began to occur, but she died in a very, in di very difficult circumstances nonetheless. So um, her education was informal. She taught herself and from her family how to be an artist. Scientific societies were not available to her. She did conduct her own research, but as I've said, it was very difficult to kind of establish that at the time and so forth. So that is, um, and the, uh, I think it's marvelous that uh, this quote at the top, there is nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. That's Buckminster Fuller. I think that's marvelous. And if you look at it, that's exactly the case. Yet we can't, it's very hard to bring that type of approach to things in, into the classroom. And I think that this is where we're missing out. Okay, Mary Anning. She became famous for her discovery of the sea dragons and just, just did an outstanding, unbelievable job of bringing in these whole fossils of these large uh, animals from the prehistoric age. And famous gentlemen would call on her and they'd seek out these fossils. They'd come down from London and other places and want her analysis, but then they would go back with it and never mention her name again. So on that matter, these men of learning sucked my brains and made a great deal by publishing works of which I contributed the contents while deriving none of the advantage. She was very bitter about these things because she could see it happening, but there was very, very little that could be done about it at the time when she was working. But finally, towards the end of her life in the last year, she was recognized by the Royal Society and a tribute was paid to her, paid to her after all this work had been done. And in the stamps, you see some of the different things that she was able to unearth. She had an uncanny ability for not only finding them, but her excavation skills were beyond compare. Uh, really like legendary. Okay. And um, with Calvino, I think this is very interesting because in 1915, she became the first woman in Italy to become a free lecturer in botany. And from there, she was able to move up very steadily in the university circle and uh, receive full credit for her academic publications and so forth. So she became a pioneer. She became from a, uh, excuse me, from a pioneer to an educator to in Italy, a sage because of what she was able to do and open up for um, women and dedicated her life to protecting nature. So she really went beyond uh, her education to these broader images of conservation and so forth. 
Okay, Wangari Mathai. She says here, because I was a woman, I was vulnerable. It was easy to vilify me and protect me, protect me as a woman who was not following tradition of a good African woman. She suffered tremendously for this, even though, as you can see in the lower box, she was the first woman to earn a PhD in East Central Africa. And of course, she then went on to found this movement of the Green Belt um, uh, plantations, where uh, indigenous native trees were being planted to try to reverse the effects of um, low rainfall and desertification. And the place she started was Uruhu Park in uh, central Nairobi. And it brought her work right next door to where uh, at president at the time, Daniel Arat Moy, Moy was, was there. And they did not get along. I was there during this time and it was not comfortable at all. So she suffered a lot of uh, persecution and eventually that did start to ease and so forth, but made the end of her life very difficult. So she went all the way to a deanship and so forth. And um, in the lower left, you can see the United Nations uh, in her commemoration issued a stamp set. Uh, the translation is when we plant seeds, we plant the seeds of peace and hope. A tremendously strong woman, and the Nobel Prize she was awarded was the Peace Prize, and I believe it's the first one in agriculture farming since Norman Borlaug's Peace Prize for the Green Revolution. So such an achievement by just a truly outstanding person who obviously went all the way from a pioneer to becoming this sage uh, at the top of my cycle there. And then we have Rachel Carson, um, she spirit, sh shares a bond with Maria Sibelia Marianne, even though they're separated by 250 years, because they worked against standards and uh, customs that were not kind of open to women at the time. Um, as you can see the quote from Stuart Udall, that she was a wo great woman who has awakened the nation by her forceful account of the dangers around us. She was prescient. She imagined without ever calling that environmental impact statements or environmental assessments. And it was during the 70s when these things really began to come on board. Uh, but quite tragically, she was not there to really see the full fruits of her labors in terms of um, what Silent Spring delivered. But she also delivered in terms of nature writing and the stories of the sea and the ocean and in such an unusual combination. And she still is just receiving much of the um, praise for that that she deserves. One thing that people don't usually talk about in these type of discussions is collaboration and cooperation. Rachel Carson had a tremendously long and successful partnership with Bob Hines, who was the only um, natural artist selected by the Fish and Wildlife Service for his work. And you can see um, four of his stamps. They were the first wildlife stamps ever issued by the U.S. Postal System. And his artistic talents and interpretation worked together with Rachel, even though that he admitted that when he first went to work for her, he was very skeptical about having a woman as his new director. They established this lifelong friendship. And I have the coming back to Elizabeth Gould. She and Edmund Lear also um, struck up this same type of harmonious relationship. And you can see now a quote from Ed Lear there. Gould owed everything to his excellent wife and to myself without whose help in drawing he had done nothing. In total, Elizabeth is now accredited to at least 650 works, some of which populated her husband's most famous work. So tremendous talent there again, now kind of coming into the forefront for the first time. And I, I felt very privileged uh, to be able to see some of this. Okay, well, it's um, also important. I always uh, come back to these things in terms of commemoration of the 10 women I, I, I worked on individually, five of their lives were taken all too soon. Mary Anning, 
uh, died of untreated cancer. Uh, it was such a shame because she was far away, could not get adequate attention, and doctors at the time weren't really that open and disclosing with the people that they saw. Rachel Carson, a misdiagnosed breast cancer, and even uh, if you read her stories about her and so forth, she was not given the full details of her illness as well. Diane Fossey, of course, was murdered in Africa, uh, still a um, history unsolved. Margaret Mee, who did such tremendous work in the Amazon and dedicated her life to, she was the first person to really call attention to that, died in a fatal car accident on a visit back home to England. And Wangari Mathai died from ovarian cancer. So I think it's fitting to keep these in mind and it's good to discuss it and let people know of it and, and that we can commemorate and share in um, their loss and successes. Okay, well, instead of simply accepting that there are no spaces where women will not be found, we should be asking why a woman might not appear in a particular sphere and who prevented her from being there. So that's from Anna Resser and Leela McNeil in Forces of Nature. And I would turn that around instead of simply accepting that there are no spaces where some underrepresented group of individuals are not found. We should be asking the question of why such a person might not appear and who prevented that from happening. So um, I believe with that, I will call it an evening and thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Joel, for that wonderful presentation. And if you can stop share, we've come back. I'm sure we have some questions um, for you. If you come back, I'm sorry. If you come back and we can, thank you so much, for Joel. If you come back and uh, unshare, there we go. Let me put a spotlight on you. For everybody. If you have any questions for Joel, you can raise your hand, I can call on you, or you can put them in the chat box and I will relay them uh, to Joel. Um, one question I have, I mean, when you realized this as a teacher and you started to, did you start to integrate um, these women's stories in what you were teaching and what did you discover when you were doing that? Joel, did you hear that question? Oh, Joel? Sakes. Uh-oh, I think we've lost Joel's. Can you take your headphones off? Joel, can you hear us? She didn't work it on it. Technical difficulties, folks. Oh, I'm back. All right. Can you hear us? I can. Yes. Sorry. Oh. I don't, it just blacked out after the talk. No worries. I was saying, I was saying when you realized this and started on your journey, were you, have you integrated these women's stories in your teaching? And if so, um, how have the students responded? Yes. So we had just started to do this as a, um, my career unfortunately was ending, but we had a unit on metamorphosis and the butterfly and was able to bring in those stories qu quite directly. And then in some of the biodiversity discussions, uh, we had students break down into groups where they actually selected somebody's um, life to discuss and we were able to feed in different individuals at that time. So. Um, not from the book, but from kind of outside the book. And that, that was, that was, that was very good. It's just that time is so short and it's like running a jumping hurdles to get through a year in that course. And even with that limited time though, it was very exciting because we had a lot of um, 
different groups in the room at the time and they picked a whole range of people. And I have a, um, a question that in terms of, you know, you were talking about textbooks and anthologies and a lot of times when we're trying to um, bring into the light those that have been kept in the darkness, uh, those that have been in the light feel that they are now being cast into the darkness, I guess, uh, to say, to keep that kind of analogy. So in your, your, at the last part of your presentation, when you were talking about the space for these people, will we have to uh, quote unquote, get rid of some of the people we already learn about to make room for these other folks that we have not been learning about? I would be interested in hearing some other opinions on that because um, I think there's a way it can be done. Uh, I think that's why it's important to set kind of a goal for the course of the teaching as a whole and then line up behind that goal. And if it's biodiversity, it certainly needs to be broadened out. If it's just um, thinking of um, a pre-med uh, chemistry type approach, that would look like something different. Okay, do we have, does anybody want to uh, comment about that? You can raise your hand or I can call on you, you can put it in the chat box. Joel, have you, um, now that you've started to study uh, women naturalists, um, are you just, are, do you continue to, to uh, discover new folks that we need to know about and appreciate? When I was just uh, doing a cursory search, you know, if you would look back in the, to Queen Hatch's foot from, 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 from Egypt, she was the first person, she was really into trees and did a uh, botany studies kind of like that and so I mean are you are you uncovering new new people from the past as well as how do we also shine a spotlight on the people right now I have kind of held steady where I am right now and I'm trying to look at the preparation of stories about these naturalists that can go uh, further on in education so that this is about the group that I'm with right now. So I'm aware of them and have, you know, met some and so forth. I, I didn't get the Jane Goodall, for example, in this discussion and so on. But uh, right now, that's kind of where I've stopped. Gotcha. Calvin, you have your hand up. <clears throat> hey, um, Joel, thanks so much for this presentation. Um, I saw it on the website and uh, I was really interested in it because, um, well, I'm interested in this topic as a naturalist and, um, you know, someone who's female assigned. And I guess I'm just wondering what, um, it's not been my experience that other um, men show interest in this. And I guess it's sort of like a unicorn. Oh, I'm sort of wondering, you know, are there certain lived experiences you've had in your life that have has made you more interested in marginalized groups being repre represented represented in this field? Because I'm based on what I'm seeing is you're a white man, and that's just, it's just not my experience that this is that you are uh, that this happens, and so I'm just wondering what how can we help other men get here. <laughs> So you're talking at a very personal level and uh, you're very intuitive. And uh, yes, definitely I, I related to many of the themes that came out in here personally. And so it was a good motivator, but really what I was uh, still, what I was primarily as after was working with students in my class and feeling like we were not up to where they needed to be. We were not matching their levels of inquiry and diversity with what I was able to present in the classroom. And that's where most of it started. But as I began to uncover these things, I related to it extremely personally. 
So you're absolutely right. Uh, I don't know how much more to say on that, but um, how to spread that I think is, that's what I'm working on these uh, yeah. six steps about the barrier breakers to show that the importance of allowing that to happen and facilitating it. Um, and of course, we're in a world now, uh, even in America, where barriers are being erected rather than broken down in many cases, even in education and literature and reading. So um, yeah, it's, it has a lot of dimensions beyond just what I talked about that are very personal to me. Thank you. It's and, really I think, really and, and, and Calvin, I think that it's, it's, it's also um, important that it is a white male who is giving this presentation because it would be so, I don't know, more typical or expected it's, uh, what less, it, it, if it were somebody else, if it was a female or, or, or who, whatnot. So I think that's very interesting um, um, observation, Calvin. Yeah, and thanks again, Joel. And um, I do think sure. that men and, and white folks will listen to you more <laughs> than they would. And that, you know, there's studies to show that. So keep up the good work. And, um, Thank you. And I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Kay um, asks, who or Joel, who's your, fa your favorite female naturalist and why? Oh, that's really a difficult question. I, I would have to say right now, uh, because I've Heard her talk in Vineyard's Jenga doll. I think that right now um, that's a very precious heritage that she embodies, and that when she's gone, that there will be a great, great loss, along with Tom Lovejoy and Neil Wilson. So I think that her work is just truly uh, path breaking, her optimism, her earth first, her uh, grasp of life, and, and the way she um, can build a story to you as a personal individual I had the chance of discussing things with her once and it just was fabulous um I would have to say after that one Gary Mathai because I did so much work in Africa and can relate to what she went through and uh, her bravery and hopes that it will really become an important movement in East Africa as they need it badly so uh, that's a great question we also have a question from Steve, and I'm not sure if uh, it is comment on the racial equity turmoil that followed when the Sierra Club hired its first black CEO. I'm not sure if that, if you can speak to that, but if you want to, you, you're, you're welcome to. I wasn't aware of that, but if it's anything like what happened when Jackie Robinson was approaching his entrance into the, the field or what Hank Greenberg went through when he was about to set foot in Detroit and so forth, I can clearly understand it. And that's why I say it's so important to that these singular people to recognize all that's behind him. Uh, in Jackie's case, you know, not only was Branch Ritchie the, the manager behind him, but before Branch was free to do anything, the commissioner of baseball had to change because prior to that had been a commissioner totally uh, opposed to any type of integration. So I, I don't know if things have settled out in, the, in this Sierra Club, but I hope that there is a, uh, a, a, a group that they fall back on and that they can consolidate that and break those barriers. And, and once they're broken, then uh, build on that. Thank you. Let's see, do we have any other questions? Uh, Joel, or comments? Oh. Uh, this is Fred, Fred Pinckney, a friend of yours. Um, I know, know you. Yeah. Um, Rachel, um, Rosalind Franklin has gotten a fair amount of attention maybe in the past 10 years with different books written about her. And, you know, it's pretty clear that she got a raw deal um how is that story being told so recently how has that resonated with other women scientists and i know there was that program on pbs about i think the four women scientists who were uh you know several of them were abused by a professor in antarctica and is i guess i'm sort of asking sort of two sides of a question there's both the professional 
sort of ignoring of someone. And then there are all the personal struggles that women have gone through. And do you see that evolving in a good way now? No, it's a wonderful, uh, thoughtful question. You know, Rosalind Franklin, there is a petition to the uh, Nobel Society to try to make awards posthumously. And I've written in for the same type of thing to the uh, World Food Prize to try to engineer that for Nikolai Vavilov. And there's been a stalemate on that so far. But um, there was a recent article in Science on exactly what Watson and Crick took from her in, in making that decision. It's very powerful. And I think that through, through that story, uh, it's elevated the issue enough that it's not as um, easy to have those things happen these days. But as you recall from my list of the six areas, um, recognition, authorship, research, and so forth, those are all the things that were controlled at the time and it was an exclusivity or a club and very difficult to penetrate and so um i think that there are places where that is easing there's other places where it still hasn't um completely opened up yet i'm sorry that's not a perfect answer but i think that um her case continues to fester because it's not been resolved and commemorated in the way that it should be. Um, Luz uh, uh, asks, said, thanks for a great presentation, yes. And they would like to see a list of naturalists you studied and the resources shared. Will these materials be shared out? We'd love to use the platform we have to share out on some of these figures. So I guess that's a general question. If if they want to get in touch with you to continue the conversation and uh, maybe um, you know share some some resources. Um, absolutely, I can also tailor a lot of these things to the particular needs of a given speaker or audience and so forth. Uh, they were very um, categorized for tonight because I was covering a lot of the waterfront, but they can zoom in and out on certain naturalists, zoom in and out in certain topics and so on and so forth. So um, if you'd like to be in touch with me, that would be great. And I can also make some of these things available. And of course, the foundational papers this is based on, they've both been published. So they're available uh, through uh, my sites and so forth. Could you put your um, email or the, the place where they can um, get in touch with you on that? Um, on yes. the, in the chat box, or I can, I think um, that might be good. Let me see if I can do this correctly. <laughs> oh, type message here. OK. Um, I'm just. I should have had this pulled up beforehand. Uh, and, and if you write, I can uh, link you up to the papers or, as I say, customize or work with you on any of the other material that kind of has come out of the study. The distillations, I would have to say, are not that complete in the paper yet. That's the part I was working on for this presentation. So be happy to look at distilling this in a way that fits your needs. And um, this past year, we were, we've got a very small grant from the If Then uh, Foundation, and I can put that up here. They have, this is what a scientist looks like. They have um, a list of all of these current modern uh, women scientists, and they, they had orange statues made of them, and they were placed on the mall in Washington, and they could go up there and see. Well, we were able to highlight uh, some of the naturalist ones um, in the museum with posters near, near things as well. So that, that is a good resource for, I think somebody put in there uh, for the contemporary list. Um, it's the if, then, uh, 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 collection, if then collection. So if y'all want to look that up, that's something to consider. 
Um, and just for Joel's information, we have, you know, in Maryland, there's Mary uh, Banning, and she was known as the crazy toadstool lady. Her, she did the fungi of Maryland um, with beautiful, beautiful illustrations and scientific uh, uh, descriptions. And uh, this was, she was born on the eastern shore of Maryland and died penniless in a house of um, all of her. She tried to give her stuff away to Johns Hopkins and they're like, now nah, who wants to, who wants anything to do with mushrooms? So she ended up, it ended up going to the New York State Museum and it was just put in a, a drawer for a hundred years before it was rediscovered. But it's, um, she's another one that we're trying to tell her story and would love uh, to be able to to do to do her justice and to get those things back from New York and get them back to Maryland where they belong, um, she discovered new 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 species of mushrooms and um, she she deserves uh, some accolades on there. Are they studying them now or just sitting on them? The the plates no the, oh. they're not in. They're not. They're no longer in um, in a drawer. Oh, uh, well. Covered in dust. So they they have been protected, and we have a copy of the fungi of Maryland because one of our early folks um, was interested in 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 fungi and and found out about her. But it's a fascinating story, Joel. A very fascinating story. Uh, Mary Banning. In, in IG. Do you f find that it's also um, with the uh, some movies have come out about Mary Anning and recently with Kate Winslet, is that helping to shift the dialogue as well? Um, do you? I don't know. I haven't been able to see it myself and I, I, don't, I really can't say, but um, certainly one of the measures of acceptance and popularization is the entry uh, into uh, the world of art and entertainment of these figures. And there's more and more of that occurring, so it, it can't be bad. <laughs> Got to be helpful to, 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 to build that recognition. The program is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So I'd hope that you all subscribe. Um, it's where you can find other, our, our past programs and it's a wealth of information and it's better than anything else out there on TV um, where you can go and look at it. It is Maryland Nature is our channel name. Um, oh, and let's, let's see, Dave, Dave Webb says, don't forget about Maryland naturalist Nancy Lawson, who's worked with Monarchs. Um, yes, and she did a, a pro, we did a program, a Zoom, um, all about that work as well that you can look up on our, on our website. And we are actively hoping, shining, and giving, giving women a platform to share their wonderful work um, with that, so that hopefully that these current uh, scientists do not have to break any more barriers. Those barriers have been broken and we still need to um, acknowledge that. Let's see, any other questions for Joel tonight? Joel, you put your, your email in here? Yep, okay. Yes, I did. Well, if nobody else has any more questions, and you can always reach out to Joel. He's a great resource, um, and I hope that you do to continue the conversation. Feel free to reach out to myself at bestrong at marylandnature.org. Um, if you have any ideas how we can continue this discussion, or do these women um, uh, include them in uh, more classes and shining those spotlights, uh, well-deserved spotlight on them. We are ready to, to do that and work with you. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity, Bronwyn. I hope I enjoyed it and uh, hope it was great. It was wonderful, Joel, and I hope that we can maybe come out to see you at the uh, CNO Canal and do some, something out in the field. That'd be great. All right, well, good night. Everybody, good night, everybody. Stay well, stay uh, curious, stay outside, and we'll see you. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.